recommendation on SDG, that the timing of which couldn't be better. I mean, firstly, because it is, of course, UN MSME Day. I struggle to say that acronym, I must admit. Um, but secondly, because of the extraordinary circumstances that our millions of SMEs around the world find themselves in today. And now the unprecedented crisis created by COVID disproportionately affected our SMEs and entrepreneurs, as we know. Um, SMEs accounted for 75% of employment in the sectors most exposed to lockdown restrictions, and many of them only survived because of a combination of public support and, of course, their own innate ingenuity. Um, but most have emerged indebted and weakened, um, with many in need of profound transformations to address vulnerabilities exposed by COVID and, of course, to compete in the post-COVID environment. Now, um, just as they were beginning to recover, um, Russia's large-scale aggression against Ukraine has thrown the strength of that recovery into doubt, as SMEs are now faced with rising inflation and interest rates, sluggish demand, and of course, further disruptions to, to value chains. Um, these challenges compound the vulnerabilities created by COVID, as well as the challenges accelerated by it, and challenges that have exacerbated pre-existing differences in capacities to adapt the digital transformation, for example, which risks creating further divides between agile, digital, innovative businesses, and those that struggle to access financing skills and know-how. And these gaps weigh on recovery prospects, of course, but they also risk exacerbating social and territorial divides. And of course, those same challenges manifest themselves in the green transition, which will not be met unless we have the right policies in place to support our SMEs. And as one of our recent reports makes clear, and I encourage you to read it, um, there'll be no net zero without SMEs. So in this regard, the OECD recommendation could not be timelier, as it offers a coherent framework to address these and indeed many other challenges that can help policymakers to tap the full potential of SMEs and entrepreneurs, and of course map a path to resilient and inclusive recovery. Now critically, the recommendation recognizes not just the diversity of challenges and the opportunities, as there are many, especially in the light of the recovery and resilience plans underway in many countries, but it also recognizes diversity among our businesses and entrepreneurs and the need to avoid a one cap fits all approach to, to SME policymaking. But the recommendation also recognizes that SMEs and indeed governments can't do this alone. Uh, we need everyone on board, all the players and all the SME ecosystems. And that's why I'm so excited to see the mix of policymakers and stakeholders that have taken up our invitation today. And we need a, a renewed partnership to drive this agenda and the recommendation will help power that. Now, I began by saying how timely the recommendation was, and it, it is for all of the reasons that, I, that I've mentioned, but it's arguably oh so long overdue. And, and I'd like to say a huge thank you to all the delegates in the OECD Committee for SMEs and Entrepreneurship that were created last year, and in particular, Martin Godel, who's with us here today, the chair of that committee, for all of their excellent inputs and strong drive throughout this process. And let me also give warm thanks to the many diverse policy communities, including many other OECD committees and many other stakeholders, including vitally entrepreneurs themselves, who have worked diligently over the past months and on the guiding principles underlying the recommendation. And let me end by saying that this new OECD legal instrument represents a strong political commitment by governments, not only to the importance of coherent, robust and transversal SME and entrepreneurship policies, but also to the importance that they attach to SME and entrepreneurs in our economies. And I look forward to hearing from the many excellent speakers that we have here today to hear how we can build on this strong momentum. And with that, let me pass the floor to Celine Kaufman, um, the head of our Entrepreneurship, SMEs and Tourism Division, who will be today's moderator. So Celine, over to you. Well, thank you very much, Nadim, and uh, welcome to all of you. And in particular, I want to wish you a happy UNMSME Day. And thank you very much for joining the session today. And without further ado, and because we have a very dense agenda that I'm very keen to make the best of, let me start the scene setting <laughs> part of our agenda, the first session. And first, I really have the pleasure to give the floor to Martin Godel, the chair of the OECD Committee on SME and Entrepreneurship, and non-trivially the head of SME Policy Division in the State Secretariat for Economic Affairs of Switzerland. Martin, um, I don't see you, but I see you now. Uh, very much welcome. And uh, maybe to trigger your intervention, let me ask you the question, what does this new OECD recommendation on SME and entrepreneurship policy represents for the Committee on SME and Entrepreneurship and the policy maker that you are? Please, Martin, the floor is yours. Thank you. Thank you very much, Celine. And 
And thank you also, Nadim, for the, for the great introduction. And I just want to say first, uh, welcome also to everybody and, and who is joining this talk here today. And because, as you said, United Nations MSME Day is the perfect day to launch the recommendation on SME and entrepreneurship policy. And, uh, and, and you get here something brand new as the OECD Council at ministerial level adopted the recommendation on June 10th earlier this month. And uh, so what does it represent? It represents a milestone, a milestone for the OECD and its Committee on SMEs and Entrepreneurship Policy. Now, governments around the world have long recognized the importance of small and medium-sized enterprises in economic growth, job creation, local development, inclusion, and social cohesion. And in recent decades, awareness has also increased on the crucial role that SMEs and entrepreneurs play in the adaptation of economies and societies to major transitions, including greening, digitalization, globalization, demographic shifts, and labor market transformations. Such role is even more evident in the post-COVID era as transformation accelerate and new uncertainties emerge. Nadim mentioned some. And this strengthening the resilience of SMEs and entrepreneurs, enabling their adaptation to the digital and green transitions, ensuring that they contribute to more sustainable and inclusive growth are shared policy objectives across the recovery plans and longer term growth strategies of our countries. This makes it all the more urgent to address a long standing demand for frameworks and tools to improve SME and entrepreneurship policy effectiveness, ensuring coherence and synergy across the varied policy areas and actors that shape the business environment and accounting for the large diversity of SME and entrepreneur population. The recommendation on SME and entrepreneurship policy we're launching today aims to address this long-standing demand, providing a holistic framework for coherent and effective SME and entrepreneurship policy. The recommendation builds on more than two decades of work by the OECD. It responds, responds to the ambitions and strong drive by member governments to strengthen the role of the OECD as a global forum and standard sector for SME and entrepreneurship policy. This was reflected last year in the elevation of the then existing OECD working party to a committee level, the highest status in the organization structure. And importantly, not only did governments support the elevation to a full committee, but for me, as, at least as important is that during the extensive consultation process, we received very strong support of SME associations around the world for this elevation step to a full-fledged committee. And I want to thank here everybody who is around the table who uh, gave us uh, this, this support. The Committee on SME and Entrepreneurship provides a forum for open dialogue and knowledge sharing among diverse actors. It supports evidence-based policymaking by driving the development and dissemination of robust, comparable and timely statistical and policy data and indicators and by developing policy analysis in areas such as SME digitalization, greening SME finance, inclusive entrepreneurship and entrepreneurial skills. This first OECD recommendation on SME and entrepreneurship policy allows the committee to fulfill its core mandate, notably by breaking down policy silos, encouraging action and monitoring under a shared coherent framework and the raising the profile of SME and entrepreneurship policy in the global debate. Also the adherence to the recommendation by Bulgaria, Brazil, Croatia, and Romania is a strong signal of the global relevance of the recommendation. And let me greet here all the representatives or participants from these countries in particular. As we continue our journey to improve SME and entrepreneurship policy, the committee will invest fully in implementing this recommendation. This will involve the development of actionable tools to support governments in specific fields, such as embedding SME lens in rulemaking, for example. This will be done in close cooperation with the main stakeholders in the SME environment and the ec entrepreneurial ecosystem. And I invite now the participants of this meeting to bring forward their inspiring ideas, your inspiring ideas. How can we make the implementation of the recommendation in a most effective way? And I look forward to continue our exchange 
to ensure that this recommendation makes a real difference to SMEs and entrepreneurs in our countries. And I would like to give back the floor uh, to Celine. Thank you all. Thank you very much, Martin, and uh, for the call as well to continue the, uh, the, the good way that the committee has taken. Now, Lucia, turning to you, you are the deputy head of the uh, Division on Entrepreneurship, SME and Tourism, and you've been a driver of this recommendation for years from the time it began its path as the SME strategy. So can you tell us uh, what is in this recommendation? What are the key components? Lucia, the floor is yours. Thank you. Uh, thank you, Celine, and thank you, Martin, uh, for, uh, for this uh, overall introduction. Uh, I would like then to, to take the opportunity to go in fact uh, into some, uh, some substantive element of the recommendation. Uh, as it was highlighted, this is a recommendation that acknowledges that uh, the policies that impact SMEs and entrepreneurship uh, are very varied. They are taken at many different levels by many different players. They include uh, the policies uh, that uh, aim for structural reforms, so that look more at the overall uh, framework conditions, the business environment. It includes policies that are targeted to the business population, regardless of their size uh, or other characteristics. And of course, it also includes policies uh, that are specifically targeted to small businesses or even to a part of the small business population. So within this rather complex environment, uh, uh, the recommendation aims to offer uh, a navigation plan, a coherent and strategic approach that encompasses all these dimensions, a mix of targeted and horizontal measures. It's a recommendation that it's articulated in 15 guiding principles uh, and it's structured into three main pillars. So let me go briefly uh, across these pillars. First of all, the first pillar is a pillar that focuses on policy coordination and governance. So it focuses on the effective mechanism to design, implement, monitor, and evaluate policies in order to ensure that uh, synergies are there, that there is coherence across the many government bodies, the many ministries and, and agencies, uh, that take decision with regard to uh, SME and entrepreneurship policy. It looks also at ensuring that there is coordination across levels of government, the national, the regional, the local, even the supranational in some cases, uh, through some effective governance mechanisms, as well as place-based approaches that recognizes also the importance of territorial regional differences. It calls for a cross-cutting approach, uh, that is to say, ensuring that across the different policy areas that have an impact on SME performance outcomes and prospects, uh, uh, SME and entrepreneurship uh, uh, characteristics, needs, uh, and uh, specificities are duly considered. Uh, Martin mentioned uh, the case for SME lenses, developing SME lenses across different types of policies. We can add the importance of user-centric approaches in implementation as to address uh, trade-offs, reduce administrative burdens, but also take uh, into uh, account the possibility to uh, take advantage of synergies. And all of this naturally requires that, uh, however, the large diversity of SMEs and entrepreneurship is considered, is duly taken into account, such as, for instance, uh, with uh, more granular data, more granular understanding and information about uh, the diversity of the SME population. The second pillar concern uh, transitions and resilience. Uh, so it's a, it's a pillar that uh, consider the drastically changing environment for SMEs and entrepreneurs, such as those brought about by the digital transformation, by the green transition, by the changing configuration of global markets and global value chain. And so calls for a policymaker to support SMEs addressing these changes adapting to this changing and seizing the opportunity that emerges from them. 
So enabling uh, uh, in, in different ways the SME population to benefit from this transition. And it's, uh, uh, these are guiding principles that places large emphasis on, for instance, conducive regulatory frameworks, but also open markets, uh, uh, incentives for innovation, uh, for adoption of technologies and innovation, as well as for uh, uh, innovative entrepreneurship and scale up. But this is also a pillar that uh, recognizes the role of SMEs and entrepreneurs for the overall resilience of economies and society. So the role that they play for a more sustainable, resilient uh, and inclusive future, which means taking into account also important aspects related to inclusive entrepreneurship, encouraging entrepreneurship, but also by underrepresented groups, uh, uh, ensuring that there is a level playing field uh, and conducive conditions for productive and decent work for all types of entrepreneurs, including the self-employed, but also including, for instance, entrepreneurs uh, in the new platform economy. And it's a, it's a pillar where principles underlines uh, the important social impact of SMEs and entrepreneurship. So the relevance for policymakers uh, to encourage responsible business conduct uh, and for improving the social outcomes of uh, entrepreneurial activity. And finally, the third pillar of the recommendation focuses on access to resources. So it calls uh, for uh, enabling uh, SMEs and entrepreneurs to access the strategic resources that they require for, uh, for thriving, for scaling up, uh, for innovating. Uh, these include innovation assets, knowledge and innovation network, uh, diverse financing instruments, sources and channels that cater to different type of needs of SMEs and entrepreneurs. It calls for developing skills and entrepreneurial mindset, uh, placing emphasis in particular on transversal skills, those that are relevant uh, across tasks, across jobs and sectors, such as digital, managerial, problem solving skills. And it also places an emphasis on the importance of strengthening the ecosystems of small businesses and entrepreneurship, uh, that comprise a large variety of actors, including the role that uh, the importance of strengthening productive uh, linkages uh, across value chains between SMEs and large firms. Uh, I invite, of course, all of you uh, to, to look into more detail of this guiding principle, but we are all Implementation as the recommendation is open to non-member adherence, it has a global relevance. So we look with much interest at the fact that uh, non-member countries or accession countries have already decided to adhere to the recommendation. Uh, the recommendation is a soft instrument, legal instrument by the OECD, soft law instrument. Uh, it has a very important component that relates to reporting about its implementation. So there will be a process of reporting to the OECD Council. And the implementation will be supported by the development of implementation tools. Uh, uh, a toolkit will be developed over the coming period, over the coming years, where we look for uh, feedback, for input suggestion by, by all of you also in the discussion today. And it will be an implementation stage that will leverage uh, the activities of the OECD, of the Committee on SMEs and Entrepreneurship in particular, as well as others, uh, the data lake of, uh, uh, of performance uh, information on policies that is being in the making, but as well as the other flagship publications that are produced by the committee, such as the Outlook or the Finance Scoreboard. Thanks a lot. Uh, thank you very much, Lucia, for the very clear presentation. So today is about the launch of the OECD recommendation on SME and entrepreneurship policy, but it's also about the broader effectiveness and quality of the uh, SME and entrepreneurship policy agenda. And on that, there is no moving this very important agenda forward without the strong drive of the policy enablers at the highest possi possible level. And this is why I'm really thrilled to uh, now move to the 
to the second session of today's uh, discussion, the high level remarks, and to have with us a number of those government officials that have the vision and ability to implement a strong SME and entrepreneurship agenda at home. So let me uh, welcome uh, for that session, State Secretary Jano Havek from the Slovak Republic. I understand, unfortunately, that the Secretary General uh, Raul Blanco of Spain um, is not able to join the session, but maybe he'll uh, come later, so we may give him the floor later. But let me finally welcome Ambassador Adriana Meja Hernandez of Colombia and thank you all very warmly for your presence. Before we hear your very important perspective, I'd like to air the intervention of two ministers that have wished to record videos for this occasion and that you will recognize as very strong leaders of the SME and entrepreneurship agenda at the OECD, but also beyond. And let me first welcome the recorded intervention of Minister Stuart Nash, Minister for Economic and Regional Development, Forestry, Small Business and Tourism of New Zealand. My name is Stuart Nash and I'm the Minister for Economic and Regional Development, Small Business, Tourism and Forestry for the New Zealand Government. New Zealand is a nation of small and micro businesses. There are approximately 530,000 small businesses in New Zealand, representing 97% of all firms. They account for about 25% of our employment and contribute over a quarter of our GDP. We have a higher percentage of small and micro businesses than other countries. Most countries define small businesses as having fewer than 50 employees. By contrast, in New Zealand, small businesses have fewer than 20 employees. So our small businesses really are small. Yet research demonstrates that the small business sector is the engine room of adaptability, change and economic development in this country. Small businesses are the home of innovation and, in the current economic climate, many are quickly adapting to the ways they operate, trade and engage with their customers and other businesses. I am very pleased to be part of this significant event in celebrating MSMEs across the United Nations and the launch of the recommendation on SME and entrepreneurship policy. From a public health perspective, we are unfortunately still in the middle of a global pandemic. And it continues to have an impact in many ways. At the same time, the war in Ukraine is compounding the global shocks we are seeing reverberate through our economies. This has created a very uncertain time for the world and in particular for our small businesses. I've been reflecting upon this as the New Zealand Minister of Small Business. New Zealand agrees and is following the OECD recommendations on SMEs and entrepreneurship policy. To this effect, New Zealand is implementing a whole of government approach to small business policy. We recognise that this approach needs to be cross-cutting and coherent. It must include mental health and wellbeing measures, as well as economic and financial support mechanisms. It must also be informed by a comprehensive understanding of what small business owners and operators and managers are going through. We know that they need access to resources and people with the right capabilities and skills across a wide range of expertise. Compliance costs need to be as low as possible so they can concentrate on doing the business. My government's policy approach is informed by the New Zealand Small Business Strategy. Now this strategy was developed by a range of respected business people and sets out the key areas and initiatives that small business owners and operators have advised would make a difference. I see the strategy as influencing other areas of government policy such as education and training, regulation and access to capital, and of course, mental health and well-being. As the chair of the OECD Digital for SME Committee and a champion of the SME digitization agenda, I see a world of opportunities that digitization creates for businesses. In response to COVID-19, New Zealand developed the Digital Boost Programme, a free online learning platform for New Zealand businesses funded by the government to help grow business potential. Our latest addition to the Digital Boost platform is the Checkable Tool, a free service using diagnostic and logarithms to identify where businesses should focus their efforts to improve their digital performance. We have also added a digital facilitation scheme. 
This scheme provides funding to business groups so they can help companies get the most out of Digital Boost. The government and private sector are working together to help small businesses through the establishment of the Digital Boost Alliance. Alliance members are committed to providing free, discounted or subsidised digital tools or services. Members include companies like Microsoft, all of our major banks, Facebook and our two largest small business accounting platforms and many other companies. Additional investment from our private partnerships helps us bridge the digital divide, build digital skills and create new ways of working. It is clear to me that accelerating digital adoption provides a platform for a sustainable and resilient economy for the small business sector. New Zealand's population is becoming more culturally diverse and this is reflected in the small business sector as well. From 2013 to 2038, Māori are expected to increase from 16 to 18% of the population. Pacifica peoples are projected to increase from 8 to 10% of the population and Asian peoples are the fastest growing groups in our population as well. They are projected to grow from 12% in 2013 to 22% by 2038. This means that the compliance processes and small business initiatives need to be accessible to and inclusive of people of all cultures and languages. More effort is required by agencies to reach business owners whose first language is not English. Diversity and inclusion will be an ongoing focus for us. The government is leading the way in embracing diversity in the small business sector. One area we ha where we have already made a start is on the Digital Boost platform which has a dedicated site in Te Reo Māori. This site includes digital stories from Māori-owned businesses, as well as captions on every video in English. We also have simplified captions in Chinese, Hindi, Samoan and Tongan. The government is continuing to develop and refine ways of engaging with all communities to ensure our services meet the needs of our diverse population. Kia ora, ki kaha and good luck going forward. Let me now uh, turn to the second strong leader of this uh, agenda at the OECD and beyond and welcome the recorded intervention of Minister Robert Troy, Minister of State for Trade Promotion, Digital and Company Regulation of Ireland. Ireland welcomes the OECD recommendation on SME and entrepreneurship policy. It is directly relevant to our economic objectives and policy for recovery and sustainable growth. In Ireland and around the world, we are having to respond with unprecedented speed to the challenges that face SMEs and entrepreneurs today. External events such as COVID-19 and the war in Ukraine have required robust and timely policy interventions to help SMEs and entrepreneurs adjust to new economic challenges. Meanwhile, the acceleration of megatrends such as the transition to digital and green ways of working have also required decisive and forward-thinking policies to ensure that SMEs and entrepreneurs are equipped for the future. The OECD re recommendation will support coherent and impactful SME and entrepreneurship policy development to address these challenges. The guiding principles set out in the draft recommendation align with our current priorities in Ireland to deliver concrete improvements in key areas such as SME digitalisation, access to finance, management skills and cluster development. Through implementation of the SME and Entrepreneurship Growth Plan, we are also working to ensure a more cohesive and unified approach to state supports so that SMEs of all sizes and across all sectors receive a consistent level of support, allowing a greater number of them to increase their productivity, competitiveness and digitalisation. Other priorities include internationalisation, applying the SME test to access and potentially mitigate the impact of new legislation on SMEs, and SME access to public procurement opportunities. We can only achieve these objectives through effective coordination and alignment of resources by various actors across government. I welcome the fact that this is a central theme of the OECD recommendation on the SME and entrepreneurship policy. To optimise the impact of the recommendation, I believe it is necessary to implement all aspects given the interdependencies that exist within it. 
This has certainly been the experience of my department through our implementation of SME and entrepreneurship policy in Ireland. For instance, SMEs will only be able to grow in international markets if they succeed in navigating both the digital and green ad agenda, have the right management skills, access to finance and other critical elements. Enterprise Ireland, an agency of my department, has responsibility for assisting exporters and potential exporters and has set out several initiatives to create resilient, internationally focused Irish enterprises. We have set an ambitious target to add an additional 2,000 exporters. The SME Growth Plan also highlighted an adequate supply of credit to SMEs through state-backed loan schemes and equity investment schemes as a key action. Climate is obviously high in everybody's agenda, and how we look after our planet now will determine the landscape for the future SMEs. Ireland's Climate Planning Fund for Business is targeted at companies of different sizes and all different stages of their zero carbon journey. The Enterprise Emissions Reduction Investment Fund supports grant aid to reduce the payback period on key carbon reducing technologies for manufacturing. These investments increase the resilience of companies to compete in decarbonised supply chains and puts them on a pathway to net zero carbon. Also aligned with the recommendation, we are collaborating with the OECD to help ensure that entrepreneurship training programmes are more inclusive of different populations such as women, migrants and people with disabilities. When it comes to implementing the recommendation, one key challenge is to ensure a unified approach that brings together all of the actors that play a role in fostering better inclusive and sustainable growth for SMEs. In September 2020, we set up an SME Growth Task Force comprised of all the relevant stakeholders including ministry and enterprise agency officials, entrepreneurs and business leaders to deliver a long-term strategic blueprint for SMEs beyond COVID-19. I co-chaired the implementation group which was established in February 2021 to examine and take forward these recommendations and again all the key stakeholders are represented. Through this implementation group, we have identified priority recommendations that we feel have the most potential to make a positive impact on the SME sector in 2022. We have worked hard to ensure a joined up, holistic approach to implementation involving regular consultation between our department, state agencies and the business community. In the same way, implementation of the OECD recommendation will require effective coordination of the many and varied strands that play a role in national SME policy development. I look forward to continuing our engagement with the OECD and other member countries on these important policy issues. Thank you. Well, these videos will be available on the on our website, the website of the of the recommendation. I understand that some of you may have had some issues showing these videos, so don't worry. You can watch them uh, at peace in your living room because they will be put on our website as as well. So now let me actually turn to uh, State Secretary Yano Ravek. It is really a pleasure to be in contact again with you and uh, to have you in the discussion of today. And the question that we would have for you is, can you tell us the priorities of SME and entrepreneurship policy for Slovakia and the role value added that you see for this new OECD recommendation? State Secretary, the floor is yours. Yes, I, we can see you. Please, State Secretary, the floor is yours uh, on your perspective of the priorities for SME and entrepreneurship policy in the Slovak Republic. Welcome. Thank you very much, Celine. I had some difficulty with the camera and fighting with that uh, to the very last moment, so I didn't hear you calling my name. Uh, dear friends, uh, let me first congratulate the OECD, Celine Kaufman and her team, the new chair of the new committee, actually for creation of the committee of the OECD on SME and entrepreneurship. 
I see that as a very important signal that the OECD is uh, assigning the, uh, these issues of uh, SMEs development and entrepreneurship very uh, in high importance. So it is one of the priorities and I congratulate you on that and looking forward to all other uh, products of the committee and the products of its work. I think this one that is uh, we are debating here, which is OECD Council meetings, uh, is a very good product and I congratulate you on that achievement. Sometimes when we are debating with the experts of OECD and debating their uh, reports, uh, my concern as the policymaker is that those reports uh, are having uh, way too many recommendations. And uh, uh, for the policymaker that is overburdened by many other agendas, it is always useful to reduce the number of recommendations as, as much as possible. And uh, if, uh, I've seen from your exercise that it was almost, uh, uh, not almost, it was a really uh, global exercise where there were 180 uh, responses from 48 countries. So I can imagine how gargantuan work it was to uh, reduce all these proposals uh, into nice three pillars containing uh, 15 guiding principles. So I want to congratulate you on, uh, on that. What concerns the, the principles themselves? Well, I subscribe to all pillars that are defined. Uh, they are very well targeted. And let me not maybe comment the pillar number two, which is the uh, sort of transition and resilience. The large part of that is uh, urgent response to the immediate situation uh, in, the, in the world. And the, I believe that, of course, it is now the largest part of our policymaking activities to make sure that our companies are able to face this very difficult situation of uh, supply chain disruptions, etc. But that is the most pressing and the most important uh, uh, priorities for us today, especially uh, I'm talking uh, from Slovakia, which is the neighboring country of Ukraine. So we are feeling immediate impact of the war in Ukraine. And I was not before February 24th. Uh, I would not believe that uh, after February 24th, the number one priority for us will be to make sure that uh, our businesses will be able to have the energy supply in terms of its uh, energy security in terms of physical availability of energies or the energy commodities like oil um, and gas. So uh, we are facing this very uh, difficult situation. Of course, maybe 90% of our activities are focused on that these days, but the art of the policymaking is the way how successfully we are able to combine these uh, urgent responses with the ability to continue in longer term uh, approaches. So I like, I believe that the pillar number one and pillar number three is all about these longer term approaches. And uh, uh, especially the governance issue that's the important and the close to my heart because i was representing for more than 20 years the businesses and uh, i from that time remember that uh, of course the politicians and policy makers were always ready to come up with a long list of positive actions to support the businesses but they were unable to do the most important thing to avoid doing some things, to avoid unnecessary increases of the regulatory burden, unnecessary increases of the financial burden. So I, after joining the Ministry of Economy, uh, focus all my 
activities on the pillar or the most of my activities on the pillar number one on improved governance on improved the uh, legislative uh, process at all stages in order to increase its quality and the part of that is of course the uh, reducing existing regulatory burden by introducing the large packages of uh, the measures that are easing the administrative burden. The first package is introduced in 2020, uh, contained 115 measures. The second package that was adopted uh, just uh, several weeks ago in the parliament this year, contained almost 200 measures. And we have the third package of these uh, uh, administrative burden reduction measures prepared containing more than 300 proposals and we will negotiate that with the other uh, ministries of course uh, and in order to reduce the existing burdens in existing legislation we are also introducing what was not in slovak uh, policy making process uh, usual in some countries it is not in our case we are introducing the regular ex post evaluation and we are just going to uh, publish the register of 50 regulations that will be evaluated by responsible ministries by the end of uh, this year so that's the all about the existing regulation and the reduction of the burden but we have also adopted quite courageous uh, measures to prevent the future uh, growth of regulatory burden from newly proposed uh, legislative uh, activities and uh, we have in, we have introduced in uh, may 2021 the pro principle one in one out which is uh, there to uh, to make the for new obligation for the ministries to compensate for regulatory increases by the reduction of the regulatory burden in the other area and we have made this uh, one in one out principle as of january this year the one in two out principle so that is the systemic measure how the regulatory board burden should actually be going uh, down so these are all kinds of measures, of course, that are not new, that were uh, uh, that were tried by other countries. We've been inspired by these countries. So we are trying to make this uh, uh, coordinated effort as massive as possible. And we will see the results will be there maybe in one year time when these uh, measures will be in place. The last sentence about this, of course, this is especially targeted for government ministries, government officials. It is expected to impose the discipline on the way how they prepare the legislative proposals. Even such bold measures, however, are unable to impose this discipline on politicians. So we need, to, at, the, at this stage, we are trying to train our colleagues at other ministries to use this new approach and the second stage is we will try to uh, <laughs> to help understand politicians and other policymakers to accept that uh, new mechanisms and methodology that is aim there to help the most uh, i would say the companies that are small and medium sized companies because they are most sensitive to this uh, unfortunate uh, unfavorable regulatory environment and the last remark on the third pillar on funding and i believe that it is really very important from the point of view of the smes especially these times uh covid 19 uh, war and consequences etc like others mentioned that but i believe uh and i am not sure if we are unique uh, you will tell me that our our uh priority in this area is to use to maximum possible level the market allocation of resources. 
and it is both true for uh, the EU funds because uh, because we are the member of the European Union and our businesses, the large part of their funding comes from the European uh, infrastructure and investment funds. And the other part is going from the private sector. Now, and our strategy is to allocate even EU funds with the market allocation mechanism. So what we are doing today is that we will reduce the amount of money uh, from EU funds that will be uh, distributed by government, uh, by various ministries, by government officials, by organizing calls, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. We are significantly increasing the amount of uh, EU funds that will be allocated through commercial banks. So we will send that uh, amount of money to the special entity. That entity is signing the uh, agreements with the, the contracts with the commercial banks. And commercial banks will be providing loans. Of course, there will be element of, of the or possibility to combine loans with the grants. So uh, these grants will be coming from EU funds as well, but it will be market, uh, from market point of view, more sort of, uh, uh, it is going to have the more market logic than the decisions made by uh, the government officials. And uh, from this point of view, I expect that it will bring the more efficiency into the market allocation of scarce financial resources. And what comes, uh, what, what is important for the funding from private sector, we are hopeless as a country when it comes to the uh, stock exchange and market capitalization. If you look at the different uh, comparisons of even EU countries, we are always occupying the, the last uh, rankings uh, of that comparison. Our market capitalization is close to zero. So the Scandinavian countries having the market capitalization close or above 100% of the GDP. That's our textbook example we would like to follow. Uh, there are many opportunities how to increase the possibilities for institutional investors from uh, you know, the uh, pension savings, how to mobilize them and how to use for funding the, the projects uh, within the economy. And uh, there is the very small fraction of funding for SMEs from uh, venture capital. And we would like to increase that uh, as well. So thank you very much, Celine. Thank you very much for the whole team. Uh, Definitely, we are trying to apply some of the elements of the principles described by you, but we are always keen to learn from the other countries and uh, to be inspired by their bold approaches to improvements of environment for small and medium-sized enterprises. And we are ready to stay uh, the active part of this uh, wonderful group. Thank you very much. Uh, thank you very much, State Secretary, and count on us uh, to continue the good cooperation and uh, in the in, in the implementation of the recommendation uh, as well. So you've raised very important questions in relation to the regulatory policy, regulatory burden agenda, and the access to funding that I'm sure the, we will come back to uh, in the panel discussion. And I invite the, the panelists to reflect on these questions as well. Meanwhile, uh, please let me also give the floor and welcome Ambassador Maria Hernandez uh, from Colombia. I understand that your minister could not join. So we are very grateful that you could step up or step in at the last minute. Uh, you know well, Ambassador the OECD. So, how do you think that this uh, recommendation uh, fits into Colombia's SME and entrepreneurship uh, priorities and agenda? Thank you so much, Celine. And uh, I, I wish uh, first and foremost uh, to thank the Secretariat for convening this very important meeting. A uh, special greeting to Secretary of State. And also, um, I would like to excuse Deputy Minister uh, for Business Development, Jorge uh, Enrique Garcia, who couldn't join us um, today. 
uh, due to uh, commitments that came up all of a sudden. Um, it is a real pleasure to join the experts and panelists to discuss SMEs, which are of extreme importance to Colombia. Just to give everybody an idea of our context, it is estimated that SMEs and MSMEs represent close to 99% of businesses and generate more than 78% I'm sorry, of total employment, in addition to being responsible to close to 50% of our GDP. It is no secret that this sector was very hard to hit during the pandemic. With this in mind, our government designed and has implemented the commitment to Colombia, which is a recovery strategy as a pledge to achieving economic and business reactivation, as well as to respond to the effects of the crisis that was originated by the COVID-19. Of course, MSMEs were at the center of this strategy. Specifically, the strategy is focused on four lines of work, uh, to respond to the most pressing needs of MSMEs. The first one is related to business financing. The second is related to business transformation into the new, what we call the new normal. Third one is uh, devoted to economy for the people. And the fourth one is related to improving the environment. So given the time constraint, I would just like to mention a few examples of what we are doing. Uh, in the past few years, we have launched the National Entrepreneurship Policy, a national formalization policy, and a national strategy focused on supporting micro-enterprises. We have also been working hard on developing productive linkages and on promoting digital transformation of SMEs. Finally, following an expert's mission on internationalization, we have issued the policy document internationalization policy for the productive development of regions in Colombia, which includes multiple actions focused on fostering the integration of MSMEs into regional and global value chains, as well as developing the necessary, the necessary enablers to this end. That being said, we find that most of our concerns and priorities are very well reflected in the OECD recommendation that we are launching today. Colombia was very active during the drafting and discussion of this text, and we are happy to see that the final result is very well balanced and that it has benefited from the perspective of a wide range of actors, not just OECD policymakers. Actually, the recommendation recognizes that MSMEs worldwide have shared challenges on many fronts. However, in line with Nadine's comment on the topic, it also reflects how heterogeneous MSMEs are. This is not only across sectors and firm size, the national, regional, and local context is also very relevant. For instance, for Colombia, and also for the Latin American and Caribbean region, and most developing countries, the issue of informality is a great challenge. Including a specific mention of this issue makes the recommendation all the more suitable for policymakers at a global scale. All in all, I am confident that the OECD recommendation will be a useful guide for policymakers both for OECD member countries and beyond the organization. We are already seeing this, this very wide reach with the four countries that are in the process of exceeding the organization as was mentioned by Martin uh, earlier on. Once again, thank you for this uh, invitation and I look forward to the panel discussion. Thank you so much. And thank you very much, Ambassador, and also for your leadership on these issues within the OECD, as you are the chair of the Group of Friends on SME uh, and Entrepreneurship at the OECD. Thank you, Ambassador. And now I'm very delighted to uh, open the panel discussion to the critical government representatives and the stakeholders that have agreed to share their perspective on a bit of a broader theme, which is the future of SME and entrepreneurship policy. But before uh, I start going to the panelists, um, let me show you in three minutes exactly the feedback that we've received from a number of key stakeholders and that we have uh, combined for you in a very short video. Okay, I don't know for you, but I don't hear anything. Yes, no sound. 
No sounds, right? Shall we give it another try with the sound on top, if we can? Thank you. We live in a very challenging world with many, many things are competing for our attention. We've had the impact of two years of COVID, of course, and now that's compounded by the strong economic ripple effect of the war in Ukraine. In these difficult times for European businesses, SMEs are the first to be hit. We've had a number of natural disasters and shared the challenges that COVID's presented with our small and medium enterprise community. Those of us who've been pursuing the issue for many years are delighted to see uh, the OECD bring both the political weight to this issue that it deserves, but also to apply its, uh, its wisdom uh, and its convening power. To try and identify ways of ensuring our businesses, our smaller businesses are robust think about contingencies and how to tackle some of these unexpected headwinds. If the recommendation was fully implemented in Europe, if all ministries, if all agencies, if all departments, today we would have a globally very competitive SME and entrepreneurship based economy. We will go a long way to tackling these big issues that SMEs are encountering. The OECD recommendation provides a useful guidance for a new generation of policies. And I'm looking forward to working with the OECD, not only on learning more about what other countries are doing. Los principios y las recomendaciones de la OCDE sobre la política de pymes y emprendimiento están perfectamente alineados. But trying to be an exemplar in implementing good, sound policy. Even if it's not the most interesting or box office aspect of the recommendation, getting the right mechanisms in place across government departments. Bringing uh, countries together uh, to talk about what they've achieved and to share experience is really pivotal. A su digitalización, inna innovación, internacionalización, a su formación y su desarrollo sostenible. The recommendation ticks all the right boxes, but we need to make sure that it doesn't become a box ticking exercise. There are several challenges to its implementation. The challenge we always face is to ensure that policymakers realize that a small business is not simply a shrink-wrapped version of a big corporate. When the policy is suitable for micro-businesses, it's suitable for all businesses. But it's not true the other way around. And at right-sizing and making policy interventions relevant, that's a real challenge we all face. For the success of this recommendation, we need to have the active ownership from all EU member states. Digital infrastructure, skills, financial resources, and cooperation across sectors. The way to change something is to measure it. And we look forward uh, to seeing uh, what results that monitoring and evaluation have produced. So I'm, I'm sure you noticed that we didn't put the names of the contributors early. So it was a little game, but I'm sure that you recognized all of them and we put their name in the middle of the video more or less. So uh, I thank here Bruce Wilson, the Australian Ombudsman for Small Business and Family Enterprise, Ben Butters, the CEO of uh, Euro Chambers, Stefano Malia, the president of uh, the Employers Group um, in EESC, the Economic and uh, Social Committee of Europe, Valia Aranitu, director of the Hellenic Confederation of Commerce and Entrepreneurship, Isabel Prig, the president of the SME Commission Chamber of Commerce of Spain, and Paul uh, O'Fines, the president and co-founder of the Lisbon Council. And just uh, be ensure that you go and listen to their full interventions that uh, will be put as well on our website after the webinar and we'll share the link on, on the chat. Um, but now let me turn to our panelists having uh, listened to all the interventions early, early on to ask them the, this question, what is the future of SME and entrepreneurship policy in your view and how do we ensure impacts we heard that uh, this recommendation should not, the OECD should not become a tick the box exercise. So what needs to be done so that SME and entrepreneurship policies have teeth and have an impact on the ground to help all the SMEs and entrepreneurs uh, around us. So let me first turn to answer these difficult questions to uh, 
Director Gemma Peck, uh, Director for Business Growth at BASE, uh, the Department for Business Energy and in Industrial Strategy in the UK. Uh, Gemma, please um, give us your perspective from, from the UK. Thank you so much um, for the opportunity to speak today. I am delighted to be here. And it's been fascinating so far to hear from counterparts from across the world uh, on the importance of SMEs and how we're sharing so many of the same challenges and, and opportunities as we support them to thrive. We greatly value the work that the OEC does to advance our collective knowledge and drive excellence in policy making and so strongly support the recommendation. Uh, I was reflecting uh, when I was listening to people's remarks on um, chairing a panel in the Department of Business here two weeks ago, led by our um, historian society. And they brought together a former minister, an academic and a business leader to reflect on UK enterprise policy over the past 75 years. And it was fascinating to reflect on how it has evolved and so important to learn from it. And indeed, supporting enterprise is one of the top level priorities for my department, aiming for nothing short of being one of the best places in the world to start and grow a business, um, to create jobs and to encourage investment. And a part of this it's about increasing opportunities across the whole country or leveling up, um, as you'll hear the government describe it, to create a more resilient economy and fairer, flexible workplaces. We're working hard to drive up productivity and create high value, better paid jobs. So nothing if not ambitious. <laughs> Uh, and I lead the business growth part of the department and our job is to support SMEs, including new scaling and innovative companies. It's a fascinating, rewarding, challenging role that I love, um, which, which allows me to connect with an amazing range of businesses. The recommendation creates a really valuable guiding framework for us to use. And I thought I'd address the pillars in turn and talk about how they relate to the UK's priorities. So the first on policy coordination and governance, so important that it describes, it promotes a whole of government approach and the need to build in the perspective of SMEs and entrepreneurs. And we particularly champion a emphasis on robust policy evaluation. And that is something that my directorate is very, very engaged in, uh, including, for example, the evaluation of the support programmes that were put in place during the pandemic. So uh, we have, in fact, just published an initial review uh, of the support that was uh, delivered in the pandemic by the British Business Bank working through lenders. Um, happy to share the report in full for those who are interested, just to highlight a couple of the findings, our loan guarantee schemes, which uh, underwrote close to 80 billion pounds in loan facilities, reached over a quarter of SMEs in the UK. And the, this initial report found that that had been critical in directly securing the survival of 500,000 businesses. Secondly, the recommendation also rightly focuses on how we support SMEs to navigate and harness the major trends driving the economy, particularly those driven by technology. It's something many of the speakers have remarked on so far today. In the UK, we have a big challenge to address long-term productivity gap to competitive nations. That's an issue that's predate, that predated the pandemic. Um, and the productivity review that we undertook a couple of years ago told us how businesses, how important it is that SMEs use digital technology 
and the importance of management practices in driving up productivity. And it's for that reason that I created two major programs called Help to Grow, which address those things specifically. So enhancing digital and management capabilities. So Help to Grow Management is an intensive um, program that looks to improve um, SME leaders' leadership and management skills. And over the lifespan of the program, we hope to support 30,000 SME leaders to increase their productivity. Uh, it's been developed in partnership with industry. It's designed to be manageable alongside full-time work. And it's actually delivered by our leading business schools right across the UK and is 90% subsidized by the government. And then the sister program helped grow digital, which launched in January, and that's aiming to help SMEs across the UK adopt the technologies that could help them grow and be more productive. At the moment, it offers discounts on accounting, customer relationship management software, and e-commerce to be added soon. We hope to add in more software, solutions and technology categories over time and support 100,000 SMEs. Alongside the discounted access to the software, there's an online advice platform to help SMEs understand the benefits and which technology they should choose. Uh, also on the Help to Grow programme, we're taking, um, uh, we're pursuing a very extensive innovative approach to evaluation, um, because it's so important for us to learn about whether or not these pro programs are working. Uh, I could also talk here about the area of work I'm involved in around supporting emerging technologies, including AI, quantum technologies, uh, robotics, um, and other areas, um, which is a, a really significant focus um, for this government. And of course, many of the uh, companies at the forefront of those technologies are indeed SMEs. But I will save that for, I will save that for another time because um, uh, um, I'm probably already over my time. Um, of course, uh, uh, I have to mention the work that we're doing to support SMEs in the transition to net zero. Um, and as many of you will know, uh, our British Business Bank is actually a founding member of the OECD's platform on financing SMEs for sustainability and really important work going on there, again, to share knowledge on how we help SMEs finance that transition. I'm really looking forward to seeing the work that comes out of that programme. And then finally, on the third pillar um, of the recommendation, accessing resources, um, which keeps our eye on those really essential needs, um, such as finance skills and support networks. Uh, as I mentioned, we work with the British Business Bank and it's through them we deliver a range of finance and equity programmes. And I'm sure like many of you, we are working now on how we transition from supporting SMEs with emergency access to working capital through the loan programmes back to accessing the recovery and the growth finance that they're going to need to invest, grow and be sustainable. So look, I will leave it there. Thank you again so much uh, for the opportunity to highlight how this is relevant in the UK and some of the big things that we're focused on over the coming years. And I'm really looking forward to hearing from others. Thank you very much, uh, Director Gemma Peck, and uh, also for sharing these initiatives by the UK that are very important and your leadership on the sustainability platform at the OECD. Let me now turn to uh, Veronique Willems, who is the Secretary General of uh, SME United, the long-standing partner of the Committee on SME and Entrepreneurship. Um, please, Veronique, uh, the floor is yours uh, to share your perspective on the future of this agenda. Thank you, Celine. And uh, first of all, also, thank you for inviting me uh, to join you here today on this micro and small and medium sized enterprises uh, day um, that has been marked by the United Nations as a special day for uh, for entrepreneurs to also make the, the big public aware of the contribution that small companies bring to the economy and to our everyday lives. 
And let me also congratulate you and, and the OCD in a, in a whole with a recommendation on SME and entrepreneurship policy, because I think there are valuable uh, insights in there that can also guide uh, authorities, governments, and I think also business organizations in their daily work and, and give us a, an additional push in, in the work that we are doing every day. Um, if I look at, at how the, the SME community has been developing in the past few years, and it's already been mentioned, we've had uh, the, it's it's been a roller coaster. We've had, uh, first of all, the pandemic. Fam, at the moment, we are still in the middle of the pandemic yeah, because we all feel a bit more relieved, but I think that uh, we have to be vigilant. And it's been mentioned already by one of the previous speakers, the pandemic has hit uh, small and medium-sized companies uh, disproportionately hard. Uh, sectors who really had to close down were dominated by small and medium-sized enterprises. Um, the investment capacity of our small companies has been seriously impacted. Many of them had to take on additional loans, even though uh, that many support measures have been put in place by, by uh, governments across the globe. And I think that OECD also played an important role there to to really support uh, the exchange of, of best practices among authorities. But nevertheless, many of those small companies now are facing um, another situation of their company than what it was two years ago. Of course, some have also profited from, from the situation. Secondly, uh, somewhere middle of last year, towards the second semester, we, we experienced the, the impact of an, of an overheated economy. We saw the rise of, of energy prices, the rise of commodity prices. On top of that, we were still struggling with uh, disrupted supply chains. Those all had a negative impact on the development of the economy. And then beginning of this year, we were confronted with uh, the invasion of Russia of Ukraine by Russia, which had an additional uh, heavy impact on, on uh, supply chains, but especially also on energy prices. And if we look at what our member organizations ask, then the first thing is what also Mr. Oravec mentioned, um, creating that environment that really stimulates private investment and promotes public-private cooperation. Um, and the European member states have, uh, in that perspective, issued the Ver Versailles Declaration a bit earlier this year, um, calling on several, so, several policy measures to create an environment that facilitates and attracts uh, private investment. And for us, the main element there is to make sure that we create um, an SME-friendly environment. And that means that we have a simple and predictable regulatory environment that allows small companies to make investment decisions, to make investments, and be sure that when they take these investment decisions that they are well off for three to five years and that they don't see sudden changes in policy every six months to, to 12 months. Um, our crafts and SMEs at the moment are more and more concerned by an increasing administrative burden, such as, for instance, uh, sustainability reporting, due diligence, uh, but also the, the, the targets that have to be met for climate change are not really stable. And that creates an environment which is adding uncertainty to the already very volatile uh, environment SMEs are working in. If we look at what our SMEs asked for, we had uh, our General Assembly of SME United a few weeks ago at the same time as uh, when OECD um, approved the, the recommendation on SME and, and uh, entrepreneurship policy. And our companies at that moment called for several actions to be taken at the European level. First of all, they ask to create a more diversified, secure and less dependent energy supply by fostering uh, the deployment of renewable energy sources, by ensuring interconnectivity, developing energy storage solutions and stimulating energy efficiency. A second action that they ask for is to invest in and to develop the necessary skills to allow enterprises to innovate and to implement new technologies. A third action is to invest public funds, and for Europe especially, the Recovery and Resilience Facility, uh, particularly in the much needed infrastructure and also specific support measures for SMEs in view of the digital and green transition, of course. 
A fourth measure is to boost uh, research and innovation to develop and commercialize the required technologies to make the twin transition happen. Because as you know, there are already a lot of technologies available for the digital and the green transition, but there is still a lot of uh, development to be done, new technologies to make sure that we can really follow the climate change uh, policy and, and tackle climate change. And then a last element was also making sure that we take into account the lessons we've learned from the pandemic, being ready uh, when emergencies uh, arise, uh, openness of our single market in the European Union, uh, making sure that we can create concrete actions that really ensure the resilience of our economy. Uh, because as we have noticed in the past few years, we are not moving uh, from one crisis to another, but we are in a continuous change and we have to make sure that we set up our policy and our economy to be able to tackle this. Thank you. Well, thank you very much, Veronique. It's very helpful to have uh, the voice of the uh, SMEs heard and these four elements that you brought, uh, or five, are very important to uh, guide our work as well. Let me now give the floor to Lisa Coppola, who is the chair-elect for the National Association of Women Business Owners, which gathers over 12 million women-owned businesses in the US. And let me point out that um, the National Association of, business, of Women Business Owners were active in the consultation process that we led around the recommendations. So thank you for that as well, Lisa, the floor is yours. Thank you so much and congratulations to the OECD on this monumental step forward. Uh, as you said, the National Association of Women Business Owners represents the interests of 12 million women business owners across the United States of America. And notably, this uh, nonprofit organization is bipartisan in its approach, in its philosophy. And our outlook here in the United States is quite consistent with the OECDs. As a result of the pandemic, what we've found here in the US is that more and more women are looking for new career path. And for this reason, NABO continues to focus our advocacy efforts on micro businesses and emerging entrepreneurs. Uh, we are very data driven. According to a recent NABO Intuit QuickBooks survey report conducted just this spring of 2022, approximately 80% of the women businesses surveyed believe a micro business is a business with less than 10 employees. Notably, under our federal legislation here in the US, a small business has four. Uh, 500 or fewer employees. And for many of us, that seems like a considerable number of employees. And so NABO is advocating for lawmakers to codify a definition of microbusiness more similar to New Zealand's to be utilized by all federal agencies to better support access to capital and procurement opportunities. We know from our NABO Intuit report that smaller businesses do not have the same access to capital. And while 15% of women business owners reported receiving a loan, only 3% received a private loan for smaller businesses with smaller revenues. Also, according to the NABO Intuit report, more than half of our respondents expanded remote work during the pandemic. That doesn't come as a surprise, I'm sure, to any of us on this conference today. Almost all, a full 97% of our women business owners who introduce these new policies say that they're here to stay. But here in the United States, access remains an issue. We know from previous NABO surveys that more than a third of our Native American and American Indian women business owners and close to a quarter or one fourth of Asian American Pacific Islanders report a lack of broadband access. So policymakers must ensure that our nation builds the proper infrastructure to reach these underserved populations, including oversight of broadband expansion efforts to ensure, just like the OECD believes, that no community is left behind. Further, according to our data, 
resulting from the NABO Intuit report, the number one priority for women business owners right now is more funding or financial help. When women business owners need a network of financial professionals to help ensure they have access to the full range of funding opportunities. So establishing open communication with local and national banks open to financing small and micro businesses is critical. We also at NABO advocate that our federal small business administration outreach programs, such as women business centers, small business development centers, and the SCORE program, host events to connect women and minorities with financial institutions to form these much needed relationships. Also, we know that many women business owners in the United States lack access to financial literacy training. For women to be set up for success, there must be greater availability of education relating to financing capital and credit. And our lawmakers here in the US need to understand the new age woman worker and woman entrepreneur. Women business owners could have multiple employees or could be just starting. Our NABO Intuit report revealed that more than seven in 10 women business owners employ contractors. Here in the United States, there's a distinction between contractors and employees. And it's essential to note that for the flexibility afforded to business owners and their employees with the 1099 concept as opposed to W-2 employee status, where both laws and employers can impose restrictions that become barriers to the work-life balance needs of women entrepreneurs. Like OECD and the European Union, we want to ensure that regulations allow for flexibility for our micro, small, and medium business enterprises. Once again, thank you very much for allowing the National Association of Women Business Owners to contribute today. I thank you very much, Lisa, for this very important perspective that we hope is also reflected in the recommendation, but it's definitely ongoing work and we'll need a lot of uh, further efforts for its implementation. So thank you very much for joining and, and, and for the support as well. At this stage, let me just highlight how poorly I I've been for you the chair of that session because we're running late. <laughs> but having said that, we uh, still have three uh, very important panelists in that, uh, in that session. So we will probably take a bit more time, so stay tuned. And I'll ask maybe the panelists uh, that, that are coming to uh, try and stick to the five, six minutes that, that uh, we discussed. With that, I'm very happy to welcome Karen Heinz, who is principal officer in the Department of Jobs, Enterprise and Innovation, an SME envoy uh, for the Count of Ireland. Um, Karen, welcome. We heard Minister Troy earlier, and we know Ireland has been really at the forefront, in particular of the entrepreneurship agenda, but also of the SME one. So please, the floor is yours. Thank you, Celine, and I'm very happy to be here and to be part of the launch um, of the OECD recommendation. And as you said, I am head of SME and Entrepreneurship Policy in the Department of Enterprise, Trade and Employment and supporting the work of, of, of Minister Troy. Um, like many countries, SMEs form the backbone of the Irish economy. They make up about 99% of the businesses in Ireland and they make they, employees contribute 70% of those engaged in enterprise. And they're very important in, and instrumental in driving regional development and economic growth. SMEs are playing a central role as well in driving the recovery of the Irish economy post COVID-19 and ensuring the longer term sustainability of the Irish economic model. As you would have heard from Minister Troy, our policy focuses very much on the implementation of, <clears throat> of the SME and Entrepreneurship Growth Plan. And um, this is a comprehensive strategic blueprint which was published last year and that was designed by a task force that was led by government and included entrepreneurs, business leaders, representative bodies, enterprise development agencies and other stakeholders. It has set out detailed proposals to help more SMEs to start, to scale and to become more innovative and productive and to grow in overseas markets. The, plan, the development of the plan was directly informed by an OECD review of SME and entrepreneurship policy in Ireland, which was published in 2000. 
2019. And it provided a very strong evidence base for the challenges and the opportunities for SMEs and for the entrepreneurship sector in Ireland. The growth plan has focused now on 10 priorities which were identified. I think crucially, it sets out a more cohesive and unified approach to state support to ensure that firms of all sizes and in all sectors receive a consistent level of support, particularly around productivity, competitiveness and digitalization. Measures are now being worked on to ensure that there is a higher level of cooperation between government agencies and greater alignment around government supports for small and micro businesses. Another priority is digital transformation, including the adoption of artificial intelligence. And um, this month only the government has announced a new 85 million euro fund to help businesses to go digital, no matter where they are on the digital journey. The digital transition fund will drive transformative digitalization of enterprise, particularly among our SME sector. It is a flagship initiative under the National Recovery and Resilience Plan, which was developed by the government under the EU's Recovery and Resilience Facility. We are also focused on expanding and scaling up our current SME internationalization initiatives to increase the number of firms that are trading internationally and to expand the range of markets that they sell into. The government has set an ambitious target of achieving an additional 2000 exporters among the SME sector. To support this, another priority is to ensure an adequate supply of credit to SMEs through state backed loan schemes and also equity investment schemes and a number of other initiatives are being developed at the moment to facilitate sustainable growth for the SME sector. The other priorities include clustering, management skills, applying the SME test to try and mitigate the impact of new legislation on businesses and then also as Minister Troy said access to public procurement opportunities for SMEs. And in parallel, of course, with all of this work, initiatives are also underway to help SMEs to take advantage of opportunities offered by the transition to a green economy. And the government as well this month has announced a new 55 million euro green transition fund to help businesses move away from fossil fuels and towards more sustainable developments or sustainable alternatives. The fund again is part of the National Recovery and Resilience Plan, which again under the uh, EU's Recovery and Resilience Facility. The fund will help all businesses, but in particular SMEs, to make a plan for greener ways of working and also specifically focusing on helping the manufacturing sector to reduce carbon emissions. Increasing the number of entrepreneurs in Ireland is an emerging, is, a, is an important priority. And we are happy to be working with the OECD at the moment on looking at training supports that are available and training interventions that are available in Ireland to ensure that they are inclusive of all populations and all the different populations in Ireland, such as women, migrants and people with disabilities. All of the priorities I think that we've mentioned today are clearly aligned with the principles that are set out in the OECD recommendation. And as we have said earlier, we think the coordination of policies across government ministries and agencies will be the key to the delivery of an effective implementation. As in most other countries, responsibility for skills, access to finance, taxation, public procurement and other areas that are crucial to the SME ecosystem lie with multiple government departments and multiple agencies. And therefore, in Ireland, a unified cross-cutting approach with engagement with all the stakeholders is very important for the delivery of the SME and the implementation of the SME growth plan. The ta SME task force, is, which is chaired by Minister Troy and Minister English, plays a critical role in monitoring the implementation of the SME growth plan, and they oversee the implementation of those priorities. So Ireland welcomes the OECD recommendation, uh, which recognises the critical role that small firms play in our national and our local economies, and in creating so many employment opportunities. Many of these businesses have demonstrated remarkable resilience over the last number of years, and Ireland and policy in Ireland is committed to supporting all businesses to meet the ongoing challenges that they face, whether it's navigating the transition to a digital low carbon economy, reaching new markets, or attracting and upskilling employees. By focusing on the implementation of the growth plan, we have a very strong roadmap, we believe, to ensure a competitive business environment. And we're looking forward to ongoing engagement with the OECD on some of these other priority areas. Thank you. Well, thank you very much, Karen. It's very enlightening on some of the initiatives you've put forward, including the governance arrangement that you have through this SME task force. Uh, let me now... Um, Move to the next uh, panelist and uh, reassure everyone that we are also recording the session and we will be um, posting that uh, recording on the uh, community of the Committee on SME and Entrepreneurship so that 
you can uh, come back to the discussion whenever uh, you want. So let me now go back to the next speaker uh, and invite President Sergio Azzeni, uh, President of the International Network for SMEs, uh, a long uh, standing partner of the OECD work, uh, to take the floor on the pers his perspective for the future of SME and entrepreneurship policy. Please, Sergio Azzeni, the floor is yours. Martin Godel said that uh, these recommendations are a milestone. Uh, Nadim Ahmed said that uh, they are a strong political momentum. They did not exaggerate. I know what does it mean to build the consensus for such uh, uh, type of uh, uh, document approved by the OECD Council. It's uh, a big achievement uh, and I raise uh, a glass to felicitate the Secretariat uh, and the Chair uh, for uh, this uh, success. Uh, you can rely on the ISME for uh, being a key partner for implementing these uh, uh, guidelines. But uh, out of the 15 uh, guidelines, three are those that uh, uh, I care particularly. The first is uh, to reduce uh, uh, time, uh, um, late time payment, encourage uh, timely payments and introduce uh, uh, sanctions for those uh, large firms, public sector who don't respect it. Second, uh, to build a partnership, partnerships, uh, public, private, uh, throughout OECD countries uh, for uh, um, investing in the upskilling and reskilling of the workforce in SMEs and for the uh, small entrepreneurs uh, themselves. And third, uh, to reserve in every country a share of public procurement, uh, not only for SMEs, but also for new firms. And uh, I think that uh, uh, we can work over the next uh, five years uh, to achieve this uh, result. Now, the uh, newly established committee on SMEs and entrepreneurship has a clear mandate from the council and the mission with the deadline, five years. By uh, 2027, I hope we could uh, uh, deliver, the, you, the OECD could deliver to the, to the fourth OECD ministerial on SMEs and entrepreneurship, the result of these uh, five years of work. And, uh, I felicitate with that, and uh, we will be next to you to reach this uh, result. Thank you. Well, thank you very much, President uh, Azeni, uh, also for these very three concrete uh, ways forward and focuses that you see for the next step for the OECD. And please let me use this opportunity to ask all the participants that are a part of this um, discussion today, maybe to post on the, on the chat what they would actually advise the OECD to focus on in the years that are that in the years to come. Uh, President Arzeni, you mentioned that there is a five-year uh, reporting um, requirement, which is completely true. Uh, whether to a ministerial or not is another question, but indeed. Where would you like the OECD to be and the OECD countries to be in the next, uh, in, in, in five years is a very important question. So for the participants on the back of, of the intervention from President Azeni, if you wanted to post your advice, please do it on the chat because that will be very important for the discussion going forward at the OECD. And now with that, let me go to the last uh, panelist in that session. Uh, Mr. Getulio Vaz, who works at SEBRAE, the SME agency of Brazil, who's been also a partner in the work on, on SME and for the recommendation. Please, Mr. Vaz, the floor is yours.
Thank you. I compliment uh, all the members of this uh, uh, event on behalf of Mr. Carlos Melis. Uh, uh, I compliment uh, uh, Mr. especially Mrs. Mrs. Selena and Mrs. Lucia who have been uh, dialoguing with us at Sebrae about uh, uh, a possible partnership to 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 foster OECD's uh, participation on our uh, uh, fifth anniversary of Sebrae. Uh, let me tell you that uh, in Brazil, the impact of COVID has been relatively the same as in most countries. No? Uh, uh, MSMEs have suffered an, a, a huge impact and the main policy of the government was in fact a very expressive credit program uh, that was warranted by the government and whose uh, 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 default taxes were not as high as people, a more orthodox view on this uh, were predicting. So it was very successful program and the uh, SMEs were had a huge benefit, especially uh, with working capital, uh, to go through this uh, economic crisis. About the directly commenting the recommendation, I think it's it's a very uh, impressive instrument for us. It's. Uh, for us, it's very new, the, uh, the comprehensive approach that policies have uh, been uh, understood inside the uh, wording of the recommendation. So I would point out, for instance, uh, the diversity inside what we call MSMEs. So uh, especially here in Brazil and others, uh, developing countries, we deal uh, with uh, poverty fighting and these people are entrepreneuring uh, uh, for uh, what we call need-based uh, entrepreneur. And then we have also the high-end uh, startups that uh, need venture capital and so on and infrastructure. So it's highly diverse and policies must be entirely different uh, because the problems and uh, are, are, are completely uh, uh, socially, uh, they have a, a very different meaning. Uh, so uh, I think one of the great uh, things about recommendation is it fits not only developed countries' uh, needs, but also uh, uh, countries, uh, uh, developing countries. So uh, this is very important because uh, uh, the recommendation really has the potential to impact most countries all over the world. Uh, not only members of uh, OCDE members, but also most non-members uh, countries. Uh, in this sense, uh, I think it's uh, all important to uh, disseminate the uh, recommendation and this uh, toolkit you're, you will proposing, uh, you will propose is very important for the uh, actually use and implementation of the recommendation by most of the countries. And uh, our uh, main concern is that uh, in developing countries, uh, it's not really our case, but uh, when we see the, the most of developing countries, we, and we know some because we do have technical cooperations with them, uh, I think what, the main difficulty they have is really to implement policies, uh, the, the, the capacity 
to to reach the uh, the real uh, client that they have. Uh, the process is very uh, inefficient and and expensive, and then what comes out to reach the clients is very little because cost effective is uh, is really too bad. So there are some aspects of uh, institutional development that are needed when you see the uh, if you want uh, the recommendation is be implemented in, in these uh, developing countries. And what is really uh, important, for instance, for these uh, institutional development activities or possible activities is really to bring about the monitoring and evaluation. Now, this is a very uh, important thing. We know uh, that these activities cost money and uh, we should support uh, this kind of, uh, of approach. Here in Brazil, uh, uh, we also don't have this, this kind of uh, activity uh, very consolidated, but much less have the other, uh, let's say least developed countries in the world. And we all know that supporting MSMEs is really the path to promote uh, e equality, to promote uh, uh, the, uh, fighting poverty, and to promote development in, the, in general terms. So it's time to adopt this perspective in the developing process for most of the countries. And in this sense, recommendation is really meaningful and you are really, I congratulate uh, uh, the center for concluding this long process of dialogue. And uh, we had the great opportunity to make some comments on the preliminary version of it. And uh, it, we didn't have time to adhere on the uh, July, on June the 9th, when it was approved but I think, if I'm not wrong, I think we have already requested to adhere to the recommendation. And I, I can really congratulate you, and it will be most welcome here in Brazil. Thank you. And thank you very much, uh, Getulio. Indeed, uh, Brazil has adhered. And uh, I wanted to um, thank you as well, because I think your strong focus on implementation, on monitoring and evaluation is really uh, an excellent conclusion for that discussion. Uh, this is indeed the next step that is coming for us and a very important one because there's no use in a recommendation that is put on shelves. And we know that implementation is, is the key word uh, going forward uh, for all countries, not only developing countries, but OECD and all countries, it will be a key area of work. So. We've uh, scribbled down furiously all of your interventions because they were very rich. Uh, thank you very much to, to all. Uh, and in conclusion, I would like to not only thank you all for your contribution, but also invite you to continue the journey of that recommendation to send us you know, your suggestions. I've seen that some of you have already put some on the chat. So thank you very much for that, but do not hesitate uh, to send them to the Secretariat as well. We will um, take really at heart how we can implement that recommendation, how we can make it bite, bite and effective for SMEs and entrepreneurs. And with that, let me thank the participants, all the stakeholders that have been part of the consultation, that have contributed to the event today, and that are part of the recommendation journey going forward. And let me also thank very much the team that is behind the work. Uh, Lucia, of course, uh, Stefan Rice that joined the meeting, Cosimo, the full division that have contributed to that. And today's uh, magicians uh, behind the meeting in particular, Heather and Will that have uh, put out uh, these uh, videos that we've uh, looked at. And again, uh, you can consult again the videos and watch the, the video of the, today's event 
on uh, the, the community for the community, but also on the website. So with that, I thank you all and I wish you all a very good uh, MSME day. Again, I hope you will celebrate in different ways. And I look forward to further opportunities to have these discussions. Thank you very much. And with that, I conclude the meeting.